Now, there you go. I'm recording. So today what we'll do is we're supposed to do architecture of FPGAs, but that's not a, there's not a lot to do in there. It's like a, actually it's like around 10 minutes. I'll show you the floor plan editor of the FPGA so you can look at what the FPGA looks like at the lowest level. Instead, what I'll do is I'll redo basically what we talked about in lab. That is, I'll go through signal tap for the PS2 clock design right on the DE one. So you have a reference uh, as you work on your pro lab two, which is due week five, right? Start of lab week five. So not next week um, because next week is week four, right? So anyway, uh, before we get started with this, do you have any questions on the design itself? The PS2, everybody clear on what you have to do for the lab, yes? Okay, so uh, to recap, for the lab, you have to communicate to the keyboard. So you basically turn on the three LEDs, numlock, uh, scroll lock, and caps lock LEDs. What I did for my design is I connected the LEDs to the switches. So if the switch goes high, uh, the LED turns on. And if it's low, the LED turns off. Okay. So the basic idea behind the protocol is you have to send hex ed. It's in chapter 16 of choose book, right? So you have to send hex ed to the keyboard, which tells the keyboard that the next packet of eight bits tells you what the keyboard LED states are, okay? And it's the least significant three bits, I believe. However, remember it's in Little Indian format. So again, look at chapter 16 in the book. It tells you how to do it. So the special, the basic idea is you have to modify uh, this FSM, so you send hex ED, wait for acknowledge, send LED uh, state data, if you will, if it's on or off, and then wait for acknowledge and then just repeat. Okay. So basically, all you have to do is shift in, uh, for example, that's what I do, SW, uh, I don't have it here, but I just, like you just add the switch inputs and just shift SW2, 1, and 0, for example, in, all right? It's very simple, actually. So anyway, that's what you have to do for your lab. Uh, for today, what we will do is we'll again go, like I said, we'll go over what we talked about in lab this week. So basically, the design I gave you is for the DE2. You have to do pretty much two things, all right? First thing is you have to change the ports at the top level because the DE2 pin assignments are differently specified as opposed to the DE1. So you import your assignments and then you change the top level. Note that the top level FSM is not the top level of your project. The top level FSM simply interfaces the transmit and receive modules from two, okay? That's all it does, it's a simple FSM. Let's go back to the PS2 mouse interface. So then once you declare the correct pin assignments or ports, you have to change the appropriate uh, port mappings. On your DE1, you cannot control the decimal point on the seven segment displays. So take out the underscore Ds, right? You just don't have them defined in the pin planner. Okay, so, and this is actually, how you should have a signal tap clock. I alluded to this last week, that this has no reset per se, all right? So in the sense, it's always running because it's a sampling clock and I run it at 40 kilohertz, okay? All right, so let's uh, assemble this design, uh, download it into, on the FPGA via signal tap. Actually, let's finish the full thing. I'll let it uh, synthesize. And actually, this design really doesn't do anything, right? In the sense, it just transmits reset and waits for acknowledge from the PS2 device. The whole point is so you can see the waveforms in signal tap, okay? Actually, once this is done, I'll show you that is the uh, synthesis place and route is done. I'll show you the um, FPGA pin planner, not pin planner, I'm sorry, the floor plan editor that allows us to look at a, the top level view 
of, I mean, actually it looks as not only look at the top level view of the FPGA, but also details on the FPGA architecture. So we'll look at, at the lowest level, what an FPGA looks like. Yeah. Let this be done. And all, you know, as it's synthesizing, let me, as an aside, you have to enable talkback for signal tap to work. So to do that, um, go to tools. Okay, the flow was successful, it's great. Go to tools, options, internet connectivity, talkback options, and make sure the check mark is enabled. All right, if not, you can't use signal tap. That's all that. All right, now let's go to tools. Uh, where is the flow? Chip planner, that's what it's called now, all right? You can actually control at the lowest level, like where your design goes into on, on, on the FPGA, but we're not gonna do that, right? For I would say for 99% of the designs out there, even in industry, you really don't have to go down at the lowest level and control individually, which logic element in the case of Altera FPGAs you need to manipulate, right? But it's a good thing to know this does exist. So obviously the, more the shade of blue, the more filled in that logic. Uh, so let's zoom in. Okay. The more filled in is the logic array block, right? So this is a logical array block. And each logical array block consists of a logic element. So let's look at that. And if you go back to the selector, so let's look at this guy. Okay, this is what a logic element looks like at the lowest level on the FPGA, like one logic element. So what are these multiplexers? Okay, these are lookup tables. So you have a four input lookup table. How many possible logic functions can you have? Combinational logic functions. Four inputs, how many possible combinational logic functions? This is from 2900. That's the number of inputs. How many possible logic functions can you have? 16 is the number of possible input combinations. How many possible logic functions can you have? to the 16th, right? Because for each input, you can have zero or one, yes? So one of these can implement 65,536 logic functions. And here's a um, three input lookup table. So if you want, you can make this a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven input lookup table. So you can have two to the two to the seventh possible logic functions out of one logic element, right? And you can imagine if you go back up in the hierarchy, very annoying. And I always forget how to do this. Go back up. So let's see. Mm -mm. Perform a simple legality check. You should be able to go to the previous resource right here. And I don't know why. Anyway, so let's see. You have multiplexers. Where's your flip flop at? There it is. Okay. What kind of a flip flop is this? It's a D flip flop. All right. And you can see the clock is obviously going into clock, uh, which is correct, right? It's not gated. But anyway, so at the lowest level on FPG, you just have, that's all you need, right? You need combinational logic and sequential logic. So going back up, oh, okay, so let's zoom out. So that's what one of these little guys contains. So you can imagine, uh, so give me your control short space. Imagine how many of these are there, right? Uh, these are sometimes, let's look at what these are. These are usually memories, right? In. Let's see. RAM. Yep, RAM block. Okay. So this is on chip memory. And you obviously don't have a lot of those, right? And on the periphery is where you have the PLLs. Let's see what this is. This is actually fun. See what this is. No. Clock, right? So here's the uh, clock. Um, so this is the I/O block, actually. All right. So the I/O blocks, input outputs on the FPGA are on the periphery. All right. This is actually working as a combinational logic output. I don't know what it does. And what happens with clock routing is it's usually routed 
on the periphery of the FPGA, all right, for speed. So, yeah, you can, uh, it's very uh, instructive to look at this. Let's see, let's do one more. Let's see what this is. Oops. Let's see. Nope, we gotta zoom in more. Oh, let's see what this is. Is it clock routing? Zoom in more. Oh, there's some kind of routing going on. It's probably clock. Oh, it's an I.O. block. All right. Yeah. Oh, it's flash address. So this is a flash address pin. There's flash memory on your FPGA. So remember you do your um, pin assignments import. Yes, so you define basically all these pins, okay? So it's interesting to look at uh, the floor plan or the chip planner view of the FPGA architecture. Okay, so let's get back into our signal tab. So here is the saved data, right? So a few items, which I noticed from lab, Okay, your signal tab is basically a logic analyzer. That's all it is. It's downloaded with your design. The only thing is you can't look at your sampling clock, but anything else you learn about the external logic analyzer, like your on your HP or Agilent 54645Ds is valid over here in the sense you need a clock for sampling your data, okay? The clock frequency should be at least twice the maximum frequency of the twice the maximum frequency in your design, okay? Because of the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem to sample properly, point number two. Point number three is you want to run the logic analyzer and in, just do a single shot enable on a trigger, right? You need to trigger to save data, yes? Again, just like the external logic analyzer. So a good rule of thumb is to trigger on the global reset, all right? Your keys are active low, so that's why the trigger condition is low to high, so I download the design, hold the trigger down, key zero, and then uh, run the signal tap logic analyzer once, let go of the key, and if your design, if your clock, et cetera, is proper, you should see something. Right? Is that clear? It's point number two. Point number one is clock. Uh, point number two is trigger. And then there are miscellaneous ideas. For example, your sample depth uses on-chip FPGA memory, okay? The more sample depth you have, the more memory you need. So let me ask you this. Suppose this clock is right now at 40 kilohertz. Okay? Suppose I make this 400 kilohertz. For the same sample depth, can I see more data or less data? Why less data? It's more data, right? I cycle a lot. I'm going to save a lot more of this data. So it's as if I'm going to zoom in here. Is that clear? So in that respect, you're having less amount of information. Okay? In the sense, you may not be able to see the receive acknowledge state, for example. Is that clear? Because you're sampling a lot faster. So that means to see the same amount of information, you have to increase the memory depth. All right? Yeah, segmented means you can save it in two separate sample segments. Depends on your application, right? I've never used it. You can also trigger, for example, other advanced stuff. You can trigger on multiple trigger conditions, this and this, for example. You should explore all that. It depends on what you're debugging. For this PS2, I just needed this very simple stuff. Now, another thing about your, well, this is pertinent to the PS2. The PS2 is asynchronous in the sense, how do we zoom out? There. Okay, here. Oops. Okay. If you notice, right, from transmit reset, the time transmit reset ends, if you will. Once I get into the receive acknowledge state, this time here that is taken for the actual PS2 device to respond varies. Okay. 
Is that clear? That's why in some it's asynchronous. You don't know when it's going to respond. So you have to wait in this receive acknowledge state before it. I mean, you have to wait in there yeah, till the acknowledge comes about. Point number one about the PS2. Point number two is this clock can vary anywhere. I mean, it can be less than or equal to 20 kilohertz, right? I'm sampling at 40 kilohertz. So if the clock, the PS2 clock, is not an integer multiple of 40 kilohertz, then you won't see this as a nice periodic waveform, okay? But the bottom line is, sampling on the rising or the falling edge as according to the protocol is still done. Yeah. Yeah, signal tap because of the sampling. It's not looking periodic, right? You can try to adjust the sampling period, but you really don't know what is the frequency of the clock coming from the PS2 device. But right? I think this is generated by the PS2 device. I don't remember, is it? Yeah, they switch off. So if the PS2 device generates it, the clock frequency on the PS2 the device varies, okay, across devices. But what you need to look for, for example, is this uh, data so in the sense, okay, let's zoom in here. There is a start condition, okay? And then I transmit reset according to the little Indian. Then let's zoom out, oops. So here is receive acknowledge. For example, here is the start condition, okay? And then do I actually get, so it's hex FA, I believe, all right? The acknowledge but it comes out in little Indian format. So what comes out is A, well, it's reversed. It, what comes out is D0 through D7. So hex FA is 11111010. So what actually comes in from the PS2 device is 01011111. Is that clear? So it looks like, I think it's the falling edge which we have to look at, yes? So it's zero, 01, this should be a zero. Okay, it's not clear because it's happening exactly at the edge. But let's see, uh, zero, 01, zero, 01, and then it should all be ones. Then the parity bit should be appropriately set. Okay. So let's see. So it's, uh, it might be that the data didn't go out properly. So zero, 01, Zero one, one 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 one, and then is it parity? How does it work? Huh? So it's the parity is set if it's odd, right? So it looks like here zero one. This this is the start bit, yes. This is bit. Uh, so here is zero one zero one 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 one. And then the parity bit, and then the stop bell. Yeah, so look through this, and let me see if it is correct. Hmm. Okay, it's not it. Well, look at the PS2 protocol. All right, see if it says. I think it's odd parity. That's point. So, and then the final point is, let's say you want to look at the state mnemonics, like I've looked at here. You have to go into setup and instead of adding node or add nodes, you have to say add state machine. Okay. So right now I already tapped it, so it's grayed out. And also the final point is some of these, like the state machine node, definitely should not be synthesized away if you have specified it properly. But some of these other registers may not be visible to you. In the sense, the same design, if you compile or if you synthesize under an earlier or later version of Cordis, it depends on how, what the synthesizer does. In the sense, it might synthesize away some of these nodes. Okay? So if you see some of these in red, that means it doesn't exist. So you won't, in this data window, you'll just see zero. That doesn't mean it's not working. It just means it's gotten synthesized away. And... So what I usually tap is I definitely tap the state machine current state that should be synchronous on your state machine clock because next state is not synchronous, yes? Because next state is a function of the current state and the input. Input is not synchronous, blah, 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 right? And whatever other signals I know which is not going to be 
which should not be synthesized away. Okay, I just don't randomly sample stuff. I really think about what to sample, and that's what you should do. Because every time you change this, you have to resynthesize the entire design because you don't have incremental compilation, which is available in the um, subscription edition of Quotas. Okay. So that's about it actually for this lecture. I don't have anything else in mind, right? So next uh, Monday, we're going to start the NIOS 2 process. That's going to take, uh, it's going to take quite a bit of thinking, right? So start working on your lab to keep working on it. And then NIOS 2, when we start on Monday, is going to be, uh, it's going to be a lot of work, but that's fine. So any questions? All right, if not, we are done. I'll post this online and yeah. So, see you Monday. 20 minutes is not bad.